Welcome back! My name is Baller Scuba. This is Video Games Over Time. We are still in 1974. Today we're going to talk about the release of Dungeons & Dragons. This release would prove to be so influential on the video game industry that it deserves to be talked about more in detail. Our story of the creation of Dungeons & Dragons begins with Miniature Wargaming. Miniature Wargaming is a tabletop game in which miniature physical models of military forces are used on a model of a battlefield. A battle is then recreated one turn at a time, with fights between units resolved with simple math, sometimes using dice rolls or playing cards. These battles can take place with almost any army in almost any time period, depending on the figures and the rules. The miniature models are typically customized, hand-painted, and assembled by the players themselves. Because of the high price of these models, along with the price of the battlefield itself, miniature wargaming was never very popular, but it retained a dedicated, if small, following. One dedicated follower of wargaming was Gary Gygax, and boy was he dedicated. There is a popular story that Gygax was spending so much time playing miniature wargaming at one point that his wife believed he was having an affair, even interrupting one of his sessions to find out. Gary Gygax is very important to our story, and he founded a lot of wargaming organizations in a short amount of time, so let's mention those. In 1967, Gary Gygax co-founded the International Federation of Wargaming, IFW. The IFW was a society dedicated to board wargaming and the promotion of the publication of wargames through the use of gaming conventions and a magazine. In 1968, Gygax organized a gaming convention on behalf of the IFW in his hometown of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, the Lake Geneva Wargames Convention, which would later become known as Gen Con. In 1970, Gygax helped form a small military miniature society named the Lake Geneva Tactical Studies Association, LGTSA, who would meet to play war games in Gygax's basement. Also in 1970, Gygax was a co-founder of the Castle and Crusade Society, a special interest group of the IFW dedicated to medieval board games with its own magazine, The Domesday Book. That was a lot of different groups all at once, I understand, but it is important to try to keep them straight, since it is these groups that would help form the foundation of Dungeons & Dragons. As you might expect, Gary Gygax might have something to do with it. In the LGTSA, the small society that would play in Gygax's basement, the medieval miniature war game Siege of Bodenburg was popular. One member of the LGTSA, Jeff Perrin, took things a step further and began to customize the rules of Siege of Bodenburg in an effort to improve the game. In particular, a set of jousting and individual combat rules were added to the game. Jeff Perrin shared these rules with Gary Gygax and the two worked together to expand them. In 1970, Gygax published these rules in his Castling Crusade Society's Domesday Book. Although the Domesday Book's circulation never reached above 80, this edition of the Domesday Book caught the attention of Guidon Games, a small wargaming publisher. Based on the strength of the rule set in the Domesday Book, Guidon Games hired Gary Gygax to produce a series of wargaming titles. Through Guidon Games, Gygax and Perrin published an adapted version of their rules under the name Chainmail in March 1971. Chainmail would go on to become Guidon Games' bestseller, selling a hundred copies a month. One of these copies was sold to Dave Arneson, a wargamer in Minnesota. Dave Arneson was searching for a way to adapt the Napoleonic wargames used in his small group of wargamers. Arneson's group was moving away from standard wargaming rules by focusing on non-combat objectives and focusing on individuals instead of groups of units. Arneson had his players become fantasy versions of themselves in the medieval barony of Blackmore. He would have his players quest for magic and gold, lead armies either for good or evil, and delve into the dungeons beneath Castle Blackmoor. Arneson tried to use the chainmail rules by Gygax and Perrin in order to resolve combat, but was not happy with them. So he started developing his own mix of rules, including things like character classes and level advancement. Dave Arneson was a member of the IFW and had previously met Gary Gygax at the second Gen Con, the convention in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. The two had worked together to create a Gaidon Games published war game, 
nicknamed Don't Give Up the Ship. So in November 1972, Dave Arneson traveled to Lake Geneva to play his new game, now called Blackmore, with Gary Gygax and the LGTSA. Gygax was so impressed with Blackmore that he tried to run a similar campaign after Arneson left, which Gygax named Greyhawk. Gygax also published some early details of Arneson's game, including a map of Blackmore, in his Domesday Book magazine. Gygax and Arneson would work together to expand and refine their rules through playtesting with their own groups, eventually diverging and coming up with two different sets of rules. Gary Gygax put together a 150-page revision of his rules by mid-1973. He felt that these new rules needed to be published soon before other similar projects reached the market. He reached out to Gaidon Games, but they were too small to produce the three-volume rule set. So Gary Gygax reached out to Avalon Hill, the largest company in wargaming. But Avalon Hill did not understand the concept and turned him down. Gygax then turned to the idea of self-publishing through their own company. Dave Arneson, however, could not afford to invest in that project and did not join the company. So, Gary Gygax and Don Kay, another member of the LGTSA, founded Tactical Studies Rules, TSR, in October 1973. They gave TSR a logo with a G and a K in it for the two founders' last names, instead of, you know, the initials of the company. But, even with $1,000 from each partner, over $5,800 in 2020, TSR could not afford to publish Dungeons & Dragons. Another investor was needed. Brian Bloom was the one to do it. Having met Gary Gygax at a Gen Con, Brian Bloom used $2,000 of his father's money, over $11,600 in 2020, to become an equal partner in TSR. This gave TSR enough capital to self-publish Dungeons and Dragons in 1974. TSR produced a thousand copies of Dungeons and Dragons in January 1974, selling them for $10 each, over $50 in 2020, with the extra dice needed for another $3.50, over $18 in 2020. They sold out before the year was over. Dungeons and Dragons was a hit. So with the story of the initial publication of Dungeons and Dragons told, let's start talking about the game itself. We won't go too in-depth about the mechanics since they will change quite a bit as time goes on, but they are worth talking about. Dungeons & Dragons is a tabletop role-playing game played with a group of players. The most important player is known, at least in the original version, as the referee. The referee will draw out maps and fill them with monsters, treasures, and people on their own. The referee is responsible for the story, the world, and as a result, a lot of the entertainment of the game. Without a good referee, Dungeons & Dragons will often not be very fun. The other players are responsible for creating their own character that can then be used in the referee's world. Only after all this is done can the game actually start. With everything set up, the referee then presents the scenario to the players, and the players can then choose how to react. The scenarios and the actions are often only limited to the referee and the player's imaginations. As long as the world and the actions follow the rule set laid out in the handbooks, almost anything is allowed. Dungeons & Dragons becomes much more about a conversation between the players and the referee than a hard set of rules and a limited list of actions that must be followed. Typically though, the basic scenario is a quest to save the kingdom in a medieval European fantasy world typically involving combat through a dungeon with progressively more difficult monsters to overcome, but greater rewards the further that the party progresses. This would typically take several hours of game time spread across several different sessions. Logistically, the original Dungeons & Dragons release had three volumes. The first volume, Men & Magic, was mostly designed to be a guide for the players. This guided the player through character creation, showing what was available and what could be possible for the character. The second volume, Monsters & Treasures, was a guide to show what monsters were available for the referee to use to challenge the players and what treasures were available to reward the players. The third volume, Underworld & Wilderness, provided advice to the referee. 
It helped the referee fill out Medieval War Games campaigns, even providing miniature cardboard figures for the players to use. The volumes were limited, though, as the original volumes assumed that the players owned and played Chainmail and were familiar with its rule set. It also assumed that the players owned Outdoor Survival, a board game by Avalon Hill, so that those maps could be used. Dungeons & Dragons was still more or less a modified version of miniature wargaming, but it had a lot of differences. One of the biggest differences was the importance of individual characters. Each player creates their own character. Character creation starts with what were originally known as character abilities, although the term abilities is misleading and statistics or attributes is more accurate. Players roll dice to see what number each ability for their character will be. These abilities are strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, and charisma. Knowing how proficient the character is in each of these abilities will help determine which class and race the character should be. That means that most of the setup of the character is subject to dice rolls. There are three main classes for a character in the original Dungeons & Dragons. These help determine the specialties and playstyle of the character. Those classes are fighting men, magic users, and clerics. There are four main races for a character in the original Dungeons & Dragons. Those races are men, dwarves, elves, and hobbits. Quite the fellowship. Characters will also have an alignment. These alignments help determine a character's motivations during the course of the campaign. There are three alignments in the original Dungeons & Dragons. Those are Law, Neutrality, and Chaos. After the characters are named, given initial equipment and money, and receive a backstory, the party can be assembled and the adventuring can finally begin. For many adventures, the focus will be combat. Combat in the original Dungeons & Dragons is done using Chainmail's rules. Chainmail has a set of turn-based combat systems that are complex and sometimes vague when transferred to Dungeons & Dragons. To try to put it simply, the general process goes something like this. First, determine the turn order, either by dexterity ratings or by dice rolls. Second, roll dice to see how many hits were landed, with many characters attacking multiple times per turn. Third, roll dice to see how much damage is dealt, which of course depends on how many hits were landed. As a result of winning combat, characters gain experience through experience points. After gaining enough experience points, characters will advance a level. Gaining a level will increase the amount of health points, the number of attacks the characters will get per turn, and players with access to magic will have access to more powerful spells and the ability to use more spells per day. Basically, the more that a character is used, the more experience they have, and the stronger they become. This may sound basic by today's standards, but these concepts were groundbreaking at the time. Those are some of the basic mechanics of Dungeons & Dragons, so... Now we will talk about some of the inspirations for the game's lore. Dungeons & Dragons at its heart is based on a long tradition of fantasy. The monsters, characters, and settings are based on several different sources, including mythology, pulp fiction, and contemporary fantasy authors of the time. From Greek mythology, Dungeons & Dragons uses basilisks, centaurs, chimeras, cyclopes, dryads, giants, gorgons, hippogriffs, hydras, mermen, minotaurs, and pegasi. From other European mythology, Dungeons & Dragons uses cockatrices, dragons, dwarves, elementals, elves, gargoyles, gnomes, goblins, hobgoblins, kobolds, lycanthropes, nixies, ogres, orcs, Pixies, Spectres, Trolls, Unicorns, Vampires, Whites, Wraiths, and Wyverns. From Southwest Asian mythology, Dungeons & Dragons uses Jinn, Afrit, Ghouls, Griffins, Manticores, and Rocks. From J.R.R. Tolkien and Middle-Earth, Dungeons & Dragons uses Balrogs, Dwarves, Elves, Ents, Hobbits, Mithril, and Orcs. Some more modern influences include clerics. Clerics draw a lot of inspiration from T.H. White's The Once and Future King, published in 1958. Knolls. 
Knolls were created by Lord Dunsany in 1912. They were originally described as a cross between gnomes and trolls. Purple Worms. Purple Worms were created by H.P. Lovecraft in 1929, where they are called doles. They may also be influenced by the giant sandworms in Frank Herbert's Dune, published in 1966. And Zombies. Although the origin of zombies dates back to Haitian mythology, Dungeons & Dragons' version stems from more modern interpretations, such as the 1932 film White Zombie, Richard Matheson's novel I Am Legend, and George Romero's 1968 film Night of the Living Dead. Dungeons & Dragons does have some of its own original creations as well, including black or gray puddings, corrosive ooze monsters that are immune to cold, but are killed by fire. Gelatinous cubes, large transparent cubes that fill dungeon hallways and absorb metal objects. Grey oozes, seeping corrosive ooze monsters that are immune to cold and fire, but susceptible to lightning and cutting and chopping weapons. Green slime, a non-mobile hazard that can be killed with fire and cold, but is immune to lightning and weapons. Ochre jellies, giant corrosive amoebas that can be killed with fire and cold. And yellow mold, a deadly underground fungus that can only be killed with fire. Gary Gygax loved his liquid enemies. And that's 1974's Dungeons and Dragons. As has been mentioned before, this game proved highly influential, and it's easy to see why. The game allows for an infinite variety. The adventures and the actions of the characters are only limited by the imaginations of the players. With individualized created characters, the game allows its players to become invested in and even attached to their characters. Over the course of several hours spread across several sessions, Dungeons & Dragons encourages its players to create, explore, and evolve. Dungeons & Dragons created an experience that would become known as a role-playing game or RPG. It's hard to call it anything else, but that term did not exist before Dungeons & Dragons. The original Dungeons & Dragons had some limitations though. Dungeons & Dragons has a steep learning curve, especially for players not familiar with miniature wargaming. The game also takes a lot of time investment. The game takes a long time to play, typically spread across several gaming sessions, each taking several hours. Not only that, the game requires a lot of time to properly set up. Players can spend an entire session creating their characters, and the referee can spend countless hours creating an entire world for their players to explore. The game also does not have too many visuals. The game itself takes place in the player's head. Although the characters and monsters can be represented by small miniature models, these representations are often used to more easily keep track of the characters instead of using them to accurately depict the actions of the game. All this adds up to a large barrier to entry for a lot of players that is a struggle to overcome. For all its great points, its good points, and its weaker points, Dungeons & Dragons became a cult hit. Although it was not mainstream, Dungeons & Dragons would prove to be highly influential not only in the world of tabletop games, but in the world of video games. So we will continue to monitor the progress and changes of Dungeons & Dragons over the years. But that will do it for the initial release of Dungeons & Dragons, and that will do it for this video. My name is Baller Scuba. this has been Video Games Over Time. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in 1975.